wonderful friend of the show, Alex Perrine of the AP Substack newsletter, the good AP, uh, mm-hmm. contributing editor to the New Republic and host of the Politics of Everything, uh, the show over there. Alex, thanks for coming on. Thank you very much, Emma. Happy to be here. Well, uh, happy to have you. So um, East Palestine dominating the news this week. Um, you know, I've been fascinated to see how the Republicans have seized on this opportunity to make some sort of political stand. I think they noticed that, you know, Biden was in Ukraine. They figured that they could use this as an opportunity to connect uh, some of the language you've seen on, you know, why is all this money going to Ukraine when it could be going to X, Y, and Z, or attack Biden on infrastructure not being sufficient um, despite the Inflation Reduction Act. I'm not exactly sure where they're going with it, because if you dig a tiny bit deeper, you see that, you know, Trump was uh, a part of the deregulatory <laughs> process right. that led to, that leads to these kinds of things. Um What's been your take on this past week of this kind of crescendo of Fox and other right wing coverage of of East Palestine? Well, I mean, it's it's purely opportunistic, I think, as as you correctly note. Um, I I think it's um, seen as a convenient cudgel against Biden, right? Um, and and I think they're it's, it's being treated mainly just as a way to, you know, make this administration look bad and um, to sort of hammer against the usual right wing bugbear of like we're spending too much money on foreign aid, or in this case, Ukraine. We're we're spending too much money on them, and we're not doing enough for us. Um, the uh sort of really obvious counterpoint to that is is as you say the deregulatory push i mean in addition to it happening under trump is is just a a long time republican agenda item right i mean <clears throat> in their ideal policy world we would be having an east palestine every month or so um but you know the the reality doesn't quite so much matter but i i i think What's interesting in a sort of uh, depressing and 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 uh, unfortunate way is that they're roping it into this sort of culture war thing, and it's becoming a you know I guess to to uh, <clears throat> paraphrase Kanye, it's becoming a Joe Biden doesn't care about white people thing. Right. Um, that's sort of what they're going for here, and um, it's sort of painfully you know, obvious and, and, but uh, what, I mean, what the administration can't really do and what Biden can't do and uh, is counter it effectively because it's a disaster that happened under their watch and, and they're not interested in, you know, I think that they, they could say, you know, Trump led the deregulatory effort that led to this, but they haven't, rolled it back right like and they haven't shown any interest in in reversing those moves yes so what what can you do to defend against this politically if you did nothing to prevent it from happening and have shown really little little interest in in the kind of moves that might have prevented it yeah let's also pull up that buddha judge thing because i think that fits in well with with what you're saying here alex um i mean that's what's been frustrating for me to see is the administration has fallen back on a really old habit that democrats uh have have gotten in in, uh, embedded into their dna over the past like few decades which is consistently being on the back on the back foot of a narrative Mm -hmm. um and not being able to get out ahead of things responding uh, all, all the time to uh, Republican narrative setting um, and having to play catch up as opposed to blasting from the airwaves like, you know, Norfolk Southern, a DeWine donor, right? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Donald Trump deregulated the railroads. And so this is what we have here. Uh, 
And I think what compounds that is the fact that a few months ago, Biden voted or uh, got, got the uh, the rail strike broken. Right. Um, and so their safety concerns, which are also at the, f- the forefront of this, uh, and the fact that the workers were so overworked in this instance and, and spread thin and the cars were way too long, creating that instability and fewer workers on those trains. Um they don't really have a leg to stand on there either. So now they're just responding to a Republican narrative as opposed to making their own case and then additionally being proactive and being like the more you know, pro-union Joe president uh, yeah. by not breaking the strike. Yeah. And it's, it's as you say, it's it becomes defensiveness and defensiveness is never a good sort of political message. And it becomes defensiveness because... Um, <clears throat> they don't, you know, they can't, they can't make the persuasive, positive case, you know, against the actual villains here. Cause they, they have been, uh, they haven't, you know, they haven't, they haven't done enough, uh, uh, to hold the villains accountable. Yeah. Well, let's play this, uh, this Buttigieg clip here. Um, Buttigieg finally on the ground in East Palestine, uh, he was it took him three weeks and he came the day after Trump, which I don't think people are going to forget. And Biden still has not been there. Um, but this was this was his message where he essentially implores the railroads to stop fighting regulation where my take would be, why don't you impose your will on them as the head of the Department of Transportation? But. You know, he's a smooth talker. Let's see how he 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 uh, frames this. But also Norfolk Southern and the other freight rail companies need to stop fighting us every time we try to do a regulation in order to hold them accountable and their other railroad companies accountable for their safety record. And what we've seen is industry goes to Washington and they get their way. They got their way on the ECP rule. They got their way on a Christmas tree of regulatory changes that the last administration made on its way out the door in December of 2020. I think they're getting their way on the fines being too low. I'm sorry, but uh, if the biggest fine we can charge on a violation is $250,000 or or less, and that's an egregious hazmat violation to get somebody killed, that is not enough for a multi-billion dollar company. Well, we're acting on it with the authorities we have and calling on members of Congress to act on on it with the authorities they have, and the railroads not to wait on us to require them to do the right thing on their own. Three equal parties in this in this process. Yeah, we're all partners. Yeah, we're right. all just working together. We've got to just sync up, and it's the work. It's a workflow problem, right? right. You know, yeah. I mean, they they just need a Slack and a three joint uh, channel where they can communicate more effectively. <laughs> I mean that's that's exact that's the exactly the mindset here though is that is that the you know the railroads are are partners in this um, the uh, and when you come to it with that um, point of view like all you can really think to do when you're up there at the at the microphone is be like we need them to be better partners like we need them and in and, and you know in what world are is any industry let alone the railroad in what world is any industry going to go to the federal regulators and say make us make us do better or like like please please be harder on us that's not their job um to stop fighting us is a loser message it's a complete loser message and yeah. especially when you cannot articulate you say on the way out the door they got a a, a christmas tree of regulatory the, you know, freebies from the Trump administration. So on your way in the door, where were your where were your new regulations? Uh, I mean, not to get sidetracked on the the rhetorical device there, but <laughs> I just who you get a Christmas tree. It's more right. like what's under the Christmas tree. Yeah, I think he right. You know, he's, he's usually very articulate, but I think he got yeah. a little that one got a little lost on him. Also, yeah. like, can I just put, enter in this conversation? Like Pete Buttigieg's dad is a Marxist, like expert on Antonio Gramsci. He, he has no excuse not to know this. Right. Wow. I mean, that's just but but he is a McKinsey consultant through and through. I've been saying this, you know, for a few weeks now. It's not really as much incompetence from his end in my opinion. It's 
that he's ideologically much more aligned with the 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 rail railways and he was so ideologically aligned with the freight rail i should say that he, that's why he was so slow to understand what this looked like politically for the Biden administration for his own presidential ambitions cuz he just he wanted to kind of keep a, a cordial relationship where they're working as partners as you say alex um yeah. and and it's just again the optics of it too you know we need them to step up what what would have been strong would have been a week or so ago just announce your efforts for regulatory uh uh clawbacks or for uh what you were going to do action wise it's just, it's right. just passive language that works in a boardroom yeah it and, definitely uh, doesn't work right. on the stump and I, 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 I think it's, it's so, and again, it's, it's so against his nature to be populist and to say, um, I think even getting to the point where he is up there saying like they're bad partners is like just not in his nature. I think that's, it's right. difficult for him. Yes. Yeah, so this is a, it's an improvement for him. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I think like that, that for him counts as like fiery populist rhetoric <laughs> and, um, you know, it's got to be frustrating because if your worldview says if we pursue efficiency and we work in good faith with industry, then um, they will work in good faith with us. And, and you know, everything will if we align ourselves, government and industry working hand in hand, that'll work out best for everyone. If that's what your worldview says, um, no, you can't deal with a crisis like this. You just can't because it, it doesn't compute. Yeah. And, you know, it is also it should be noted and it doesn't really change the political optics of it. But, you know, Donald Trump is only there because it's an opportunity for him to hit Biden. Right. Uh, if he were in office, this would not be where he would be right now. He would be downplaying it. But right. that doesn't change that reality that when you're the 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 group in the party in power and the administration that you have to anticipate that disasters that happen under your watch are going to be seized on politically um and the, the again just to it, it was i think a significant miscalculation and the republicans have been just flailing about um for a few months now especially now that you know kevin mccarthy is is this completely limp and ineffective leader in the house they can't coalesce behind what they want to hold the economy hostage over with the debt ceiling they were saying it was it, in cl behind closed doors it was going to be medicare and social security cuts <laughs> but then biden called them out in the, in the state of the union and they're unable to really do that now now it's oh snap work requirements which is just like you know easy mode for the republican yeah. party <laughs> but now they they feel that they have some sort of uh, you know, f foot in the door here, so to speak. Uh, it, this was a real unforced error by Biden. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Yeah. Um, here, let's actually, though, this is a fascinating wrinkle. Um, Fox and Friends has been quietly ramping up their critique of, uh, of Donald Trump, honestly, in, within the context of the... Uh, derailment in in east palestine uh let's take a listen because this is you know shockingly critical of the former president their guy and they know he's watching he likes well maybe not as much anymore because they're rhinos well but this used watching, to be his favorite show this feels like is it Ducey desantis but I, here we go. <laughs> working class area we live paycheck to paycheck they don't have money to go stay in a four seasons plus they go there to get answers and the company doesn't show up norfolk southern because they're scared they said that they're worried about their their safety right. and then the people are asking questions they're screaming out questions if you if you watch the full video when they're sitting here in the high school auditorium right. or gymnasium and um bill johnson the congressman he said look the white house is not here if you have a question write then down. write it down here's my card sure. send it to me and all the questions will be answered i will contact the white house right uh, uh speaking of the white Good house uh, apparently regulations regarding train safety were changed during the trump administration 
Uh, this particular railroad and others lobbied President Trump to dismantle an Obama-era rule that would have required railroads to update their braking systems. And uh, apparently the Obama administration had pushed for it to govern transportation of hazardous materials after about half a million uh, barrels of crude were dumped. Uh, but ultimately, the Trump administration undid that and said the costs exceeded the benefits. Nobody understands. And, you know, when, when, when they talk that's just well i mean Ducey want he's he's the most anti-trump of those guys yeah. and there's this constant <laughs> you know unspoken tension particularly between him and Kilmeade, who seethes seethes <laughs> whenever Ducey really speaks we did we had the b-roll so we couldn't see him like white knuckling it over there but yeah. i mean like um what what do you make of that i mean they they i think republicans are getting panicked <laughs> at yeah. how how much Trump seems to be already running away with this thing as of now. <laughs> and DeSantis is doing his crime tour of like DeSantis is doing crime tours of Philly and Chicago and New York and Trump's in East Palestine. I mean, yeah. where where that that just illustrates how much more connected he is to like the the beating heart of the Republican base than culture war DeSantis meatball run. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's like Ron is um, running for president of like the comment section or something, you know, like like yeah. Ron is, is going for um, what he sees as the red meat that the base eats up. And it's like crime in blue cities, um, which, you know, for a portion of the audience, they love that shit. Yeah. But Trump. Trump is like knows what's actually going to get him on TV, right? Like he's he because he is not, you know, as I mean, obviously he's uh, uh, you know very much a creature of the internet, but because he is primarily like a, a monster created by television, he has a much clearer sense of like this will get me on TV and it's going to be, I'm going to East Palestine. Like the, b before going to, I don't know where Ron was in Staten Island or something being like, yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, no one, I mean, you're, you're just not going to get outside the, uh, the sort of right wing internet bubble with that stuff compared to like actually getting the networks to pay attention, which is for, for, you know, for Trump, like that still matters. And TV is still where his base lives. Yeah, and just go, going to a, not to make too much of this, but it just is, I think, is so illustrative. Going to a McDonald's and being like, I'm buying, it's on me, you know, it's on yeah. me. And Ron's <laughs> at the Chicago fraternity of police, like at the police union, speaking to 100 cops. 139 people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> he's really, that, that's that's just bad politics. He, he's got, he, his barometer's off. Right. I know. I think it is. I mean, I think it has. And that's been my take on Ron for a while. And, um, you know, obviously I could end up proven wrong here, but he's been playing on easy mode in Florida in the sense that he has like just in addition to the incredible amount of power he has in government, he's just been playing purely for the right wing press for so long um, that, you know, the not to paint Trump as someone who was like, uh, you know, crossing the divide or whatever, but but Trump knew to like play for the cheap seats, and and Ron, um, his only experience is like in getting the the right wing press to you know applaud him, right? Mm -hmm. And but he just hasn't had to like appeal to anyone outside of that, and say what yeah. you will about Trump, but like. You, you know, as divisive as he was, he actually worked to get people to like him and just in his insane way. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what do you make of their um, the conservative media and Republicans trying to make what's happening in East Palestine about anti-white racism? It seems like kind of like it's an updated version of you know, liberals are talking down to you and they're coastal and they treat you like it's flyover country. And frankly, Biden not showing up there doesn't help that at all. Um, is is there any there there? Well, it's I mean, it it follows this pattern of of 
you know, stuff that would have been sort of coded and implied before. Like it, it, it's well worn territory for conservative messaging, but like, um, like so much else, it's just so much more explicit in a way that is often kind of frightening now. Um, so I, I think that like, whereas before it would have been this sort of, um, you know, uh, and you still see a lot of them basically doing, using this language, but it would have been before like, you know, Biden doesn't care about real Americans. Biden doesn't care about the heartland Democrats, you know, don't care about, uh, you know, middle America. Um, and, and they're, they're by making it sort of much more explicitly racial, it's following this sort of um, very disturbing pattern in, in all of conservative politics by, by just explicitly making it like Biden, you know, is against white Americans. Um, so I don't know, in that sense, I think it just represents this ratcheting up of the rhetoric over the last, you know, dozen years or so. Um, but at the same time, like, uh, I'm not sure, again, um, how much appeal that messaging has. I, I think it's an easy thing to sort of hit Biden over. But, um, you know, I don't know uh, how compelling that message really is. Right. I mean, who I, I think it's a bit of a um, it works easier on on some people than it does for all of his faults. It's harder to make that stick to uh, to Scranton, Joe Biden. Just right. always has been harder to make that stick to him. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, that that that's what's so fascinating about his approval ratings being relatively low. Although I know they've hit new highs recently. He's up at like forty nine percent. But it doesn't. His people are ambivalent about him. And yeah. it, for the first time in American politics, it's just like not necessarily a bad thing yeah. um, for the Democrats, because <laughs> it's just I think there is this nationwide desire outside of the Republican base for some sense of calm and normalcy after those years. And that has carried this guy a, a long way. Plus the fact that he's just old, white, boring Joe and none of the standard republican attacks of he's a secret muslim or he's a shrill bitch <laughs> for hillary yeah. who's also really corrupt uh, that doesn't stick that much no and <clears throat> um that's been and it, it it is it is funny that that um you know i think you can make the case that a lot of biden's middling approval is due in part to um you know a lot of people who voted for him not being in love with him right and and there are worse problems to have. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, like, as, as you say, I think there's been this um, story since the uh, 2020 election of uh, conservatives being just driven bonkers by the fact that they can't get those kind of attacks to stick. And like, what is Hunter's laptop if, if not a sort of like, uh, extended complaint to that <clears throat> that that it didn't work in 2020 and it should have worked you know <laughs> like yeah that's right the reason the reason they are sticking with it to this day is they're like it's not fair that whatever this was didn't work <laughs> yes yeah i mean and it's just so funny that it's it's a much more you know uh, paper thin and silly version of Hillary's complaint, but they're just applying it to, to the laptop. I mean, about yeah, no, you know, exactly, Russia. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, which right. they, which they mocked endlessly. Yeah. Um, well, let's talk about George Santos a bit. Uh, yeah, sure. Cause I, I saw you spoke uh, on the politics of everything with Daniel Strauss uh, about this completely hilarious figure in, in, I mean, we are living through history with George Santos right now. <laughs> Like, yeah. what to make of this phenomenon? Because I am tickled, I, I tell you, Alex, by his recent pivot to being anti-establishment. He's yeah. like going on Matt Gates's show and, his new, and then admitting that he lied on Piers Morgan. And his new narrative is, well, I didn't lie to voters. I lied to the Republican establishment. Yeah. You know, the <laughs> rhinos. And, yeah. and that's, it's not the worst move. It's no. that's what's amazing. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, it's, he's the only guy. I mean, he really, the you know, because the guy is just a sort of 
a, a born liar, right? A congenital liar, I guess. Um, you know, there's only so many places you can go and none of those places is like contrition. None of those places is like a full, a full and honest account of everything I've right. done. That's just not one of the, that, that option's not available to him. And so like, as, as his options kind of narrow, he's like, he's, he's kind of adopting whatever track like now seems most likely to help him survive and whatever, by whatever sense, you know, um, David Roth uh, wrote a great piece uh, for Defector that, that sort of made this point that like, if Santos used to lie about kind of really silly and lightweight stuff, like um, being a producer of Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark, which is just <laughs> one of the best, one of the best lives a person can tell. It was so good. A, also, because it was such an epic failure. Yeah, it was, it was really one of the most disastrous shows in the history. You know, of I'm Broadway. a producer of Evan Almighty, too, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, so, but if, if you know his lies were sort of to to were sort of, you know, like a lot of these things were were made to meant to make him seem important or whatever. But then, like, as he drifted into Republican politics, his lies got a lot more sort of in the service of playing this particular part. And that's where you get to s- stories like his mother dying of nine eleven related causes, mm. um, and even like being in one of the buildings when you know there the evidence seems to suggest she was not in the united states at the time uh but i believe he has doubled down on that one um but uh you know and what's happening now is is i i I think he doesn't have much political electoral he doesn't have much electoral future left i think we were we all like to sort of think there's no you know uh there's nothing that's too rotten for for Republican voters to 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 accept. But in his kind of swingy Long Island district, they seem to hate him. Like they seem to really be upset that they have elected this buffoon. So I don't think he's got much of an electoral future left. No. But if he has a political future left, this is it. Like this is all he has left him. And it's gonna be a guy who uh, got famous um, for really stupid reasons um, <laughs> and is f- famous for doing just like clearly wrong and bad things. Um, and if he can turn that into being a victim of the rhinos and the establishment and the media, um, that's that's your ticket to just continuing your career forever on the sort of right wing cruise circuit. Alex, <laughs> yeah, I... For some reason, watched 20 minutes last night of Triggered by Don Jr. with Kyle Rittenhouse, just seeing if there was anything that I could mine for the show. Um, Turns out Kyle Rittenhouse barely speaks. Uh, Don Jr. talks the whole time about how we're the same. We're both being uh, persecuted by, you know, uh, right? Uh, He's a terrible, terrible host. Except he does it to animals uh, on safaris. That. (laughs) Right. right, But but to your point, like, that's just the podcast is atrocious, but it's just like general aggrievement woe is me even if i'm a terrible person or a murderer right. or you know the son of a crook and a crook myself uh i mean it's just all about uh what has been done to me and santos that's literally that's why he actually might have a future and this pivot is smart for him yeah. to be anti-establishment because that ecosystem it doesn't matter how toxic you are it's a toxic waste dump in and of itself so come yeah. on in yeah exactly <laughs> and and that's where b- being toxic is something of a badge of honor you know like yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> um can, can i just insert this tweet yes. into the, yeah please uh, so, do yeah so last night uh um i think it was uh, or yesterday uh george santos tweeted out this which makes it look like he's like building a- allies um across the party i want to personally thank josh laf lafazan for stopping by my douglas town office today it was great to sit down and discuss the concerns that were addressed in the letter he brought in hashtag new york third and just, normal uh, normal politician normal member of congress tweet right yeah just a normal <laughs> I, be, I have a friend <laughs> yeah and my friend came over and josh says let's be very clear i did not stop by your office i hosted a <laughs> protest outside your office calling on you to resign and then hand delivered you a letter to stop wasting police resources <laughs> can't say i'm surprised you choose to start the truth here you're very good at it <laughs> <laughs> so the, what's amazing is santos welcomed that he welcomed yeah. that yeah the, he also no. like he he thought he was very cleverly going to like 
I don't know, come out in front of it by being like, thanks, right. for, thanks for stopping by. Yeah, like, my friend uh, Josh Laffison, you know, he lives yeah. in Canada. You wouldn't know him. <laughs> I would. Uh, I, I really want to. I, I want to. I, I, I want to thank my good friend Scabby the Rat for coming by my office today. <laughs> he really brought discussion. Some, yeah, yeah he really brought some important issues to my attention. And <laughs> right, Tom and Jerry. To a, yeah, I look forward to a productive dialogue with him. <laughs> it is. It's a funny story, right? Everything about George Santos, I can't get it. I, I, yeah. I partly can't get enough of it. Um, but does it say anything largely about the Republican Party? Or, or how about this? What do, What is disqualifying at this point in history for a Republican candidate? Um, and also, as an aside, what the hell happened to the notion of opposition research? Because the yeah. New York Times was able to find this pretty easily. And uh, he had a Democratic opponent who lost to him by eight points, didn't come up with pretty much any of this during the race. Yeah, I, I mean, the, so the, the the topic of opposition research was actually what our episode of The Politics of Everything was about when we were talking about Santos. We talked to uh, Tyson Brody, who has done opposition research for years for Democrats. And, um, you know, he didn't work on that race, um, but... Uh, you know, he um, he doesn't he, he seems to think that like opposition research, you know, is um, all both like not entirely to blame for this in the sense that, um, you know, if they had been given the resources and the time, they could have actually done this. And then it's a question of where are you directing the resources and the time, you know, not just on the campaign level, but at the sort of party level. Um, and uh, the I, I think that it's a little funny, too, because normally you could point to the sort of death of the, the you know, the long, slow death of the of the local press for letting a Santo sort of slip through like that. Um, that's a lot less true in metropolitan New York area where Long Island has its own newspaper and there are multiple dailies yeah. in New York and there's a million websites covering local politics. Mm -hmm. too. It's not really a lack of journalism problem here. It, you know, it was just like very little attention was paid to this race. Um, and then, you know, that could be a national problem or a, or a state democratic problem of um, not thinking Santos was serious enough to actually devote resources to uncovering this stuff and make and publicizing it, you know, and, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the question of like, you know, is there anything you can say or do that renders you unelectable anymore? Um, you know, there's still, there's, I think there still is. It's just that, um many you know it, it varies depending on in which party you wish to run for office from which party you wish to run for office but um also um you know if you are um a challenger basically and and this was an open seat but it was one that was uh democrats were trying to hold um and you can just sort of way, get away with being the other guy. You can just sort of get away with that and and for a little while at least. And also like happen to be one of the most ridiculous human beings ever to walk the earth. But in when it when the political winds are at your back, um, a guy like Santos can 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 get in, you know. And I think that's gonna keep happening, but probably hardly anyone is exactly like him. He is he's one in a million. He, he so. is a very <laughs> special, so, special yeah. flower. <laughs> he really is. Like, yeah. I, I, I feel like the thing that's going to happen from Santos is all the people who lie, uh, but less like sort of uh, dramatically are just going to get passes now. Right. Because there's, yeah. I think there's a, like these guys who like lie flagrantly, politicians that lie flagrantly about their story are a dime a dozen. I think. Yeah, but totally. Just, yeah. They just haven't like, you know, uh, stolen money from a vet's dog and like a <laughs> elderly woman compared <laughs> elderly abuse across continents. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I mean it's it's totally I I I remember years ago I I I writing about Lindsey Graham who for years had uh 
essentially pretended to be a Gulf War veteran using really, really dodgy language. Um, and he was in the armed forces at the time of the Gulf War, ah. but, was, but was not a Gulf War veteran. And, you know, he got caught on that uh, decades ago just didn't stick right and i remember just like unco- i learned that myself and was like i'm gonna write about this yeah and it didn't it didn't didn't really matter no one really cared you know it's lindsey graham no, people how, you know people how many republicans kind of how many republicans remember that versus how many republicans remember that uh the guy who confronted the covington catholic kids did something uh mildly similar yeah yeah that. no exactly yeah <laughs> that's right that's right yeah Right. Well, it is. I mean, like if Trump uh, opened the Overton window of lies, it's like Santos kicked the kick the door in or whatever. Yeah. Uh, to, there's different openings there. But it's if it, 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 it doesn't the truth is not necessarily going to matter um, to Republican voters. But I don't know if it ever had. It's just more people have tried. And now it's the universe has expanded for that kind of right. thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Well, Alex, uh, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, people can check out uh, the Politics of Everything, the AP Substack newsletter, uh, and your work over at the New Republic. Alex Perrine, always a pleasure. Thanks so much. Of course. Thank you, Emma. Thank you.